Raise out your right hand like this, if you would. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond this sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, have your own way. As the porter opens the door for the shepherd to come to the sheep, open the door. Not only for the sheep gathered here, but those that watch by television or receive this message some other way. We've been all very busy, Lord, this week. And this week to come, probably also as you spare us. But we have taken out this hour around your word. Help us to get clearly the message for it might just change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go again. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tamerlane, all one word. T-A-M-M, sometimes just T-A-M-E-R-L-A-N-E. If you read up the history book, you may have done this at school, in the late 1300s, there was a famous empire builder in the area of China and Mongolia, even stretching as far as Afghanistan. And he wrote something that endured. He was uh, being hunted on this particular occasion by his uh, enemies, and he took refuge in a broken down, abandoned house. It was in a terrible state of repair, but he was able to sneak in and just kind of hold his breath and hope that the enemy would not see him. And while he was there, staring at the wall, his eyes came across a little ant, A-N-T, the little creature, and it had got a small kernel of corn in its grasp. It was bigger than the ant itself, but it had that little kernel and it was going up the wall with it, up to a, a ledge. Well, it slipped, and down came the kernel of corn. And down came the little ant and took hold of it again, and went back up again. Tamer, Tamerlane watched this. It fell again, and it fell again, and it fell again. And he counted the number of times it happened. And it slipped and fell out of the grasp of the little ant, 69 times. But he finally got it on the 70th. And he said, therein there is a lesson that I will never forget. I will go again. I do not want you, and God does not want you, lying on the floor. The purpose of this service is to help you to get up off the floor. You may have received bad news. We will never trivialize that. We're in the business of trying to help people who have just received bad news. But we know the first thing that's got to be done is to adopt an attitude that says, I'm not going to lie here and die and give in to this thing. I'm going to get up. And I'm going to go again. Amen. If you take a sponge and you squeeze it, you know what's going to come out? What's going to come out is exactly what was in it. You water in it, you squeeze it, that's what's coming out. You laminate in it, you squeeze it, that's what's going to come out. You're going to know what you had inside you when that big battle strikes you, when that terrible problem comes upon you and you're being squeezed by life, you're going to know what you've got inside you by what's coming out. And if it's negativity and fear and a total collapse, then you've come to the right place to get help so that something else can be put into you so that you can, as you face the battles of life, refuse to quit, but rather get up and go again. You may remember the famous story in the Bible of Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of God. I've often pointed out he had a remarkable name, Elijah. Elijah. God gave two of his names to that one man, 
El for Elohim, Yah for, or Jah for Jehovah. And Elohim is the God that can't be known, but Jehovah is the God that I can know. So literally his name is, I know the God who can't be known, but I've got to know him. A remarkable man. But there were so many false prophets of Baal. And just this one great servant of God, Elijah. And finally, he challenged the king who was a bad man and his wife who was bad, Ahab and Jezebel. He challenged them to arrive at Mount Carmel and they would have a showdown between him and the 450 prophets of Baal. And the showdown would be that they would get an animal, a bullock, that they would slay it and they would put it on the altar, and then the prophets of Baal would call upon their god, Baal, to send down fire and consume it. Well, they cried from morning to night, and nothing happened. In fact, Elijah came forward and started to mock them. Maybe your god's out for a walk. In fact, the Hebrew has it. It's not very nice to say it. He actually said, maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Actually, it's, that's what it is in the Hebrew. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. He mocked them. Of course, they couldn't get anywhere. And then, at eventide, he called upon the God of heaven, the only true God, the God that I have spent a lifetime trying to get to know, and then share him with others. That God would hear and answer prayer. And it says in 1 Kings 18, 38, it stands forever recorded, then the fire of the Lord fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Elijah turned and said, Slay these 450 prophets of Baal. They did. He said to Ahab, You know that there's been a drought, no rain for three and a half years. Start eating and start drinking right now. Have a feast because things are changing. But the sky was still very summery. No rain in sight. But the challenge had been met by God. There was a breakthrough. Something was going to happen. So while the king's eating and drinking... Elijah goes on up the mountain another little bit. Carmel is over the Mediterranean. He brings his servant with him. And the Bible says Elijah started to pray, but it was more than praying. It was desperation prayer, faith prayer. Not a little, oh God, help me, and, and probably you won't, amen. But I lay and hold upon God. Like Paul says, lay hold upon eternal life. Do something about it. You've got the ability to turn this thing around. Do something about it. The Bible says he got on his knees and then he put his head right in between his knees and back again and down again and back again, praying, God, you give me that great miracle. Now give me the next one that I just prophesied that the rain has come and it's been three and a half years of drought. Elijah said to his servant, you go on up again a little bit more to the very top of Carmel. They both were close to it. He said, you go up there and look out over the Mediterranean and tell me what you see in the sky. Of course, it was very sunshiny and summery at this particular point. So after a while, when Elijah's still praying, the servant came back and Elijah said, what would you see? He said, sir, I didn't see a thing. He said, go again. He keeps on praying desperately, desperately. I am going to get an answer to this prayer. I am not going to lie on the floor. I'm not going to give in to this need. The prophet came back. Excuse me. The servant came back to the prophet. And the second time he said, What would you see? Wanting him to see a cloud in the sky. He said, I didn't see a thing. He said, Go again. You know that that happened seven times? Every time the prophet said, Go again. He would go up again, and he came back, and the seventh time he said, What do you see? He said, I see a little cloud. It's just about the size of a man's hand, but it is coming across the sky at what we would call today the Mediterranean. And he said to the king, You get up. You get moving. Go to Jezreel, where a kind of a summer palace for the king was located, which he visited occasionally, and where Jezebel was waiting for King Ahab to find out how they had won the victory, which, of course, they didn't. Elijah won. He said, You get there. I'm going there too. So he started to gallop. And we're told that those horses could go at 40 miles an hour. And the dust and the smoke flying up. And while he's driving along there in those horses and chariots, with his servants, he looked around and saw an amazing sight. Here comes the world's first bionic man. You talk about the six million dollar man. Here he comes, Elijah. 
the Spirit of God came upon him, he was able to outrun the 40-mile-an-hour chariots and horses and got to Jezreel first. It was an indication of the spirit of the man. And the spirit said, when you're beaten or seemingly beaten once or twice or three times or four times or five times or six times or seven times or in the case of Tamerlan and the little ant, if you're whipped, it seems to be 69 times, you don't lie there and die. There is a God in the sky. He's interested in the brokenhearted. This book talks about the brokenhearted all the time. It talks, talks about those who are in trouble all the time. Whether it's their own fault or somebody else's fault or the devil's fault. It doesn't matter whose fault it was. The book is all about desperate people coming to a good God and receiving deliverance, but not coming on a casual basis. Uh, help me, amen, and then we forget about it. But we come to God and we say, Lord, you promised this, and Lord, if there is a battle here and I can't get it, and Lord, if I've got to go up again, I'm going to go up again. In fact, Lord, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to wrestle with this thing with a made-up attitude. I will whip this thing, not by my own power, but by the power of God. I will live again. I will love again. I will laugh again. I will prosper again again because I will not quit. I made up my mind. I'm going to go again in Jesus' name. Did you get it? Look at what your notes say here. Grab them quickly if you would. Number one says, the illustration of Tamerlane, the little ant, 69 times. He was a builder of empires in Western and Central Asia in the late 1300s. He died in 1405. Just a little historical background. I want to read the story I just told you, 1 Kings 18, 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. He heard it when nobody else heard it. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. That was the Mediterranean. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. It means every single time it happened, he said, go again. And it came to pass at the seventh time, with that persistence, that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel where his summer palace was. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins. Look this way, like those robes that they had. He, he pulled them up and tied it round them so it wouldn't interfere with the feet and the movement. He girded up his loins and he ran before Ahab, even though he was, had those horses, he ran before him to the entrance of Jezreel. Let me just read that last bit again. Verse 45. It came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he did outrun him. Look this way. The Bible reveals this. Please get it. Here is a perfect example. That you on your own have limitations, even with positive thinking or self-esteem or those earthly endeavors. But you, with God's assistance, have no limitations. All things are possible to him that believeth. Yes. You with God. You see, when you accept Christ and Christ comes in and the Holy Spirit comes in, think of the power that you have to assist you. Think of it. Think of it. The richest person who ever was, God, the wisest, the most powerful, is on the inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit. One of the translations in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit, God's power within, is not really the best. It refers to Him as the Comforter. That's not the best translation at all, because that would mean somebody who holds your hand and pats you on the brow and says, there, there. I mean, can't do much for you. 
comfort, F-O-R-T. That fort in the word comforter is a Latin adjective from fortis, F-O-R-T-I-S. And it means bravery or the one that puts courage and guts in you so that you with God are bigger than any problem that the devil has ever concocted or that ever will come your way during your lifetime. And that's a staggering thing to know. So the good news is you're not on your own. You call upon the Lord, and you're going to have fortis inside you, bravery inside you, courage inside you. The modern way we would say it would be guts to say, not just through my own ability, not at all. We don't rely on ourselves. But because of God's help, I'm going to overcome this mountain. I'm going to overcome this bad news. Maybe you get bad news from a doctor or a lawyer or a banker who said no to your loan application or whatever it was. Pull up. Gird up your loins. Pull it up. Get your feet ready. Start running. Because you and God can take care of business whatever comes your way in this life and that is the guarantee of the Bible. Blessed be God forevermore. Go ahead and do it. When I was a little boy, uh, Britain was under attack in World War II. In fact, I remember one particular time my father ran upstairs and looked out the little attic window and a bomb was coming in. Some of the bombs came in. They were very powerful, but they were just this size. And they were on little parachutes. And I was headed straight for our home and he ran downstairs and got us all under the table. I don't know what good that would do, but that's where we were under the table. I was such a little... Uh, uh, a baby at that time, and, and, and some things I remember when the war finished, I was six. So there's some things I do remember clearly, other things obviously I don't. But anyway, uh, uh, others told us later that at the last minute there was a, a rush of wind lifted it clear over our house and hit a lemonade factory which was wiped out, which was uh, nearby. But I do remember we'd get onto that little table, and my father would always keep his ear tuned to the radio. And you would hear that familiar voice. We will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them in the fields. But we will never surrender. The marvelous voice of Winston Churchill. I remember that man. I remember too being told about the time after the war when he was invited to go to a school. I think it was his old school, but it was a school. The place was packed, reporters there, all the students were there, all the teachers, all the families, all the friends, to hear the most famous man in the world, Winston Churchill, to make this great speech. And he got up, and I'm going to give you right now his full entire speech. For after he said what I'm about to say, he sat down. He looked out at those students. And all the rest of the people, as they were getting ready to go out into life to rebuild. You talk about New Orleans being rebuilt. A whole country had to be rebuilt. He said, I'm glad to be here. Here is my speech. And he looked at Ryan and he said, never, 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 never quit. And he sat down. That was the entire speech. What do I say to you today? In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, never quit. Never give in to the devil. There is an answer. And God has it at the ready for you. Look at your notes at number four and see what it says in this little poem. As I start to get warmed up. Winners never quit. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you are trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but do not quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns as every one of us sometimes learns and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when you're hardest hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. 
Look this way. Life is filled with problems and sorrows that come against us, and many of them are engineered by the devil to tear us down or to cut us off short. But there is a God in the sky, and I repeat what I said earlier. He's written a book which talks so much about the troubled and the sorrowful and the brokenhearted and how they can find deliverance. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor under heavy laden. Not talking about ordinary labor, but struggling through life for truth and for blessing. And he said, I will give you rest. Amen. So I say to you, have you failed? Don't lie there. Get up and go again. Do you feel real bad this morning? Get up and go again. Trust God. Stand on His promises and see God change things around for you. That's what He does. Look what it says here in Matthew 8, number 5 here. Matthew 8, 13. I want you to get this. Get it as if the penny dropped and the light came on. Somebody pushed the button and you're going to say, I got it. Matthew 8, 13. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Look at me while I tell you something. The future of your life is not in the hands of the devil. The future of your life is not in somebody else's hands. This was somebody who was very sick. And Jesus said, As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. He didn't even say you were healed. He said, It's up to the way you believe. You believe this much, you'll be healed this much. You believe this much, you'll be healed this much. You believe this much, you'll be healed this much. As thou hast believed. He turned it back inwards and says, if you will start to believe God, the thing will turn around, no matter how bad it is on the outside. That's a staggering thing to say. Amen. There it is again. Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Too many times, look this way a moment, too many times we surrender our lives to what somebody else said. And we think we have to because they're more clever than we are or they know more than we know. And I'm not putting them down. But none of them know more than God knows. And God wants to deliver you. This message is about deliverance. Go again. Well, I've just about quit. Well, unquit being quit. And no that above the strongest storm, the faintest prayer is heard. Know this, a man can come back no matter how far down he has ever gone. God can prosper you and bless you and deliver you. Look at that next one in number six. It says in Matthew 9, 29, Then touched he their eyes, saying, Not even according to my power, which it was his power, but the power is constant. What wasn't constant was their faith. He said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Look this way. What does that mean? Well, the electricity in these power points around here is constant. But I don't see that electrical plug over there. I don't see it lighting up the toaster. Why? Because we haven't it plugged in. Does it mean that there is no electricity in that power point? There's electricity. We just didn't make the connection. God's power is constant. Most people don't make the connection. They don't know how. So they just accept what the devil or somebody says. What you do, you look to the power point. That's God and His Word. And if you don't understand it, get some domata who does understand it to tell you about it. Then by faith you make the connection. And when you plug in, the toaster will work. When you plug in, you will find that your faith in God, not faith in yourself, faith in God, is so powerful that it says here, according to your plugged-in faith, so be it done unto you. I'm just getting started, but now that I'm going to start with Paul, I want to know we're all on the same page. If we are, just wave a little bit at me. You're following what I'm saying. Amen. It's inside of you. I'm, I don't belong to the unity or something or the positive thinking crowd that just say, you know, it's all within me. I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, positive thinking can get you so far, but it'll also lead you away from God if that's all you've got because you'll become self-sufficient. The positive thinking that we believe in is the positively thinking attitude that says, on my own I can do nothing, but through Christ I can do all things. And so you can. 
Why do I think of Henley Moore right now? Why did I think about him yesterday and pop back into my mind again? We hadn't long come to America. We were living in Kissimmee, as you know, just beside Disney World. We got a phone call to say Henley Moore was in hospital. I went to visit him. Stephen's dad was on holiday at that time. Pastor Woolley, and he happened to come with me. This is many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, or maybe more, but somewhere in there. And I went, and he's laying in bed. I said, what's wrong, Henley? He said, I got cancer, and they've given me up. I said, well, before we pray, what do you think about it? I'll never forget his words. He was an African-American gentleman. The love of God looked out of his face, and this is what he said. I will give this cancer, he said, as much respect as I would the flu. He said, all you got to do is lay hands upon me. I talked to him not too long ago. After more than 20 years, he not only got healed, he has kept his healing to this day. He is 100% healed and whole by the power of God. I was used and so was Brother Willie just as the point of contact to pray, but it was his faith and he refused to give in to the devil and the attack. He looked to God and God set him free. If ever I have learned anything in these years in this ministry, it's this. God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of deliverance. Tell it to the sick. Tell it to the poverty stricken. Tell it to the demon possessed. Tell it to those who are at the end of their tether. God is a God of deliverance. Let the devil back up into a corner. Let weakness lie limp on his glorious shoulders. Know the truth. God is a God of deliverance, and He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He wants to deliver you like He's delivered people all along who would plug in with their faith. Amen. The Apostle Paul went to three places in particular. He went to a lot of places. But he went to Antioch in Pisidia. That's a part of Turkey. That, that's separated from the other Antioch in Syria. And he went to Iconium, and he went to Lystra. Look this way. He went to what? He went to Antioch, Iconium, and he went to Lystra. Look this way. He was in God's will to do what God wanted to do. Do you know what happened at Antioch in Pisidia? A disaster. Do you know what happened in Iconium? A disaster. you know what happened in Lystra? A disaster. Well, what are you going to do when you're doing your best to obey God and everything goes into reverse? You're a good, decent person. Everything goes into reverse. Let's read about what happened to Paul, who, when he was obeying God and got into Antioch and tried to preach and see what happened. It says, Paul visits A, Antioch in Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra. All were seeming disasters. Here is what happened. At Antioch, he got thrown out of time. Look this way for a moment. I'll never forget the time when on a Saturday night we had a lot of people answering the phones. And our son happened to be in town that Saturday night and uh, he answered the phones too. <clears throat> and uh, one fellow called up local here, but with a Belfast voice. He was from Belfast. And you know, they want to fight at the drop of a hat. So he was kind of mad and he said, didn't know it was my son who answered. Oh, he said... Uh, I know this fella. This was me. Oh, he said, do you? Yeah, he said, I do. He said, I know a lot about him. He said, well, what do you know about him? Did not know when he was speaking to Leslie. Well, he says, I can tell you this. He said, he's been thrown out of every pub in Belfast. <laughs> I later wrote a book, and that's what you called it. I called the book, Thrown Out of Every Pub in Belfast. No, I wasn't. But Paul was thrown out of Antioch. Acts 13, 45 and 50. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Now, you, hold it for a second. You may think, well, now, wait a minute. I'm doing a good job here. I'm doing my best. Why is things not going good? It's part of life. It's part of the devil's attack. I mean, this man's doing good, but people are full of envy. Do you ever have people full of envy with you? If you haven't had it, you're going to get it sooner or later. Most people I've dealt with are good, decent people, but you get some doozies every once in a while. 
But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, those dirty dogs, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting. Uh, here you're turning the pages, so you must be following all right. And blaspheming. But the Jew, another verse says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city or the religious people, the chief men or the political people, and they raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Threw them out. Look this way. Ever do something or try to do something and it just melted, collapsed. And a voice said in your ear, Ha, ha, ha. You're finished now. Do you ever have a voice tell you you're finished? Either because of a sickness or a loan you couldn't get or you were turned down at something. Ha, ha, ha. Don't believe a word of it. While there's a God in the sky, miracles are still available. Amen. You can come back again. He goes to Iconium. He didn't say, well, I'm quitting. God's not helping me. Forget this nonsense. I'm finished with preaching. I'm finished with God. No, he had another go at Iconium. What happened there? Well, look at it. Acts 14, verses 2, 5, and 6. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against these brethren. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled on to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and on to the region that lieth round about. In this instance, they weren't thrown out. They heard ahead of time what was going to happen, and they ran for their lives. Failure number two. You remember the famous story of Thomas Edison when there was that terrible fire at his lab? And uh, his home wasn't too far away. And he told his son, go get your mother. Bring her out. He said, why, Dad? Why? Well, he said, your mother's never seen a fire this big before. Bring, bring her out. Let her have a look at it. <laughs> and he said, but, Dad, it's awful all your work in there. He said, I've had 10,000 experiments trying to get the light, which we now think of nothing, now shaped into a bulb. And he said, you know, he said, they were 10,000 failures. He eventually got it, the famous Thomas Edison. You could go to his uh, wonderful museum south of us here at Fort Myers, I believe it is. But he said, you know, there's something wonderful. He said, what is it? He said, my 10,000 failures have just all been burned up. What an attitude to have. What an attitude to have. I want to build it into you, to build it into you. Not just a positive thinker, but to let you know that the comforter is with you. That is fortis, bravery, courage. God is inside you. And you're going to start to trust him. You're not going to walk around with your head down saying, well, it's all over. I'm finished because of ABC. Forget about ABC. That may be a bit rough. I don't know what they'll do with this on TV. Let ABC go to hell, will you please? And you get hold of God's word and you say, no, sir, I'm a creature made in the image of God. I was made for victory. I was made to be a God container. I was made to walk about with the spirit of God in me. And I'm going to claim the promises and I'm going to win over this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So he's thrown out of one city and he runs out of another city. So does he quit? No, he's like the little ant with Tamar Lane. He has another go. If at first you don't succeed, there's an old saying in Ireland, they twisted, you know. They say, if at first you don't succeed, you're running average. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, what is it? Try, try again. At Lystra, what happened there? Because that's where he ran to. Acts 14.10, this is 14.19, excuse me, this is worse. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch, Iconium, and Iconium, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul. Now, nowadays, a lot of people get stoned, but it's a different kind of stoning than this. This man was really stoned, pelted with stones. They drew him out of the city, and they supposed he had been dead. They killed him. Actually, he wasn't dead, but they really, as far as they were concerned, he was dead. They thought, he's finished. 
But after they had left, he moved. His friends got him. They took him in, dressed up his wounds. What are you going to do now when they beat you up at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra one way or another with words or with stones or whatever? Is it time to quit the ministry or to quit living or what? Do you know what he did? He went back to all three places in reverse. Starting off with the most terrible place, Lystra. Then he went to Iconium. Then he went to Antioch. And we get that as we read on in your notes. For it says, go again. Here comes the return trip. Acts 14, 21 through 23. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, then here they come again. Hallelujah. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Three places of terrible defeat, which could have been the end of the story had they given in. And what happened? Three fantastic churches, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, now we've got churches going, we've got the elders ordained, and they prayed with fasting, commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So what is the story of Paul's work at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? Just that he was attacked or beaten up and he quit? No, he went back and three great churches were raised up. You remember the famous Lord Nelson in British history? When he was on the deck, he had only one eye. And he was told by a man, look, and he saw the enemy's ships coming. He said, I don't see them. He said, sir, take the telescope and have a look. He said, I can't see a thing. Well, he said, look through the telescope. So the famous Lord Nelson, he put the telescope up against the blind eye and he looked again. He said, I can't see a thing. We're not trying to tell you that we're idiots and we don't see the enemy. We came almost to the midnight hour regarding this property and we refused to quit. And in one fell swoop, we paid it all off as God gave us $1,115,000 to pay the whole thing off. If we had to quit the day before, nothing of this would be happening today. It would just be all a memory. We didn't quit. You're not going to quit, sure you're not. You're going to get up off the floor, aren't you? Aren't you going to get up off the floor and you and you and me and you on television? You're going to say, not with my own power and ability, but with God's power and ability. I'm going to rise again because this book is filled with stories of men and women who came back because they called upon the name of the Lord and He intervened on their behalf. Did you ever hear about Isaac's four wells in the Old Testament? Look this way again. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham had dug wells. You know it's always been a problem to get water in the Holy Land. He dug wells and the enemy filled them up, so he dug another one, the enemy filled it up, and he dug another one, the enemy filled it up. Many, many years later, Isaac comes along. That's his son. And he redigs that one. Oh, there's such opposition. Okay. He digs this one. Oh, again. Then something happened relating to Isaac's four wells. Just read it with me in your notes. Isaac's four wells. Genesis 26 and verse 1. And there was a famine in the land. They needed water. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went on to Abimelech, not the same Abimelech that Abraham had talked to, king of the Philistines, on to Gerar. And the man, Isaac, waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. God wants to bless his people. Look this way while I say it again. Somewhere along the line, the devil got out the message. That it's the people in the world who are supposed to prosper, and it's wrong for a Christian to prosper. It's wrong for any of us to have covetousness after material things solely. But the way of it is that if we put God first, 
God's people are supposed to prosper more than anybody else in the world because they put God first. That's the scriptural way. Doesn't matter who argues it. That's the Bible way. So the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great, for he had possessions of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father. The Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. Genesis 26, 18. And Isaac digged again, digged again, digged again the wells of water. These things are all written for our example. It's not just Isaac with wells thousands of years ago. It's to teach us lessons. The Bible says it's to teach us lessons. What's the lesson? The devil fill up the well, dig it again. Clear out those stones. Now oh, I lost my place. Where was I? And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley. It's good to dig in the valley. You say, I'm in the valley. Start digging. And Isaac's heard men saying, the water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek, E-S-E-K, which means contention. Look this way. If I were to start to tell you all the things that we have gone through in the monastery, it would seem like nothing compared to Paul. But I do remember the, the time I went to pray for a lady, and as I went to pray for her, she reached down like this. She was wearing big boots up to here. And as I went to pray for her, uh, you, you, normally you'd have your eyes closed, so I wouldn't have been looking. And as I did that, all in the one movement, she reached down. We didn't see it, but there was the top of a dagger sticking out, and she reached the dagger and was about to kill me, and our man grabbed it in time, and I was delivered from it. And then we asked her, why would you try to do that to a preacher in a healing line? She said, all day long a voice said to me, go to church tonight and kill Leslie Hale because it's the right thing to do. I had a man call me up one day. He said, I hate you. And he said, I, I, I had nothing to do with the man. I hate you. He said, seen you on television. And he said, I'm going to do everything in the world with the American gov government to make sure that you're deported and expelled from America and never allowed in here again. The hatred and the bitterness. Let me look into your eyes and tell you, everyone, no matter what you try to do in life, Somebody, and, and you try to dig your first well, somebody is going to argue the first well was called Essex, which is contention. Somebody's going to fight over it. If it's virgin territory, the devil will fight over it. Be prepared for a fight. The trick is that you don't quit. The trick is that you don't quit. It's not the first time those kind of things happened to us. I remember being in a mob one night with, with, with guns drawn and me running toward a police officer and, and, and talking to him with his gun drawn because there were terrorists all around. In fact, there's a thing, if I were to tell you honestly, without the shadow of a doubt, your hair would go up like this, and I'm forbidden by the authorities in Ireland to tell the story about terrorism and what happened to me. I'm not saying it, and I never even usually say that much, other than to say this. You try to do something for God, the first well you dig contention, opposition. It's going to happen to you. Are you opposed in your body, sick as a dog? Has your money run done? It's part of life. It's part of the battle. They stopped up my well. Dig it again. Don't quit. That little ant had something built into it and it climbed up there and didn't make it until the 70th time. Are you glad that we didn't abandon this thing 24 hours before the miracle came? Of course we're all delighted. What else happened? It says they strove with him. Anybody striving with you? Battling with you? And they digged another well. And strove for that also. And he called the name of that one Sitna, which is more than striving. It's outright hatred and total opposition. That's what it means in the Hebrew. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. 
And he called the name of it Rehoboth, plenty of room. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Look this way. I don't know if it's after the second well or the twenty-second well. But some of these days, the devil's going to get exhausted. And he's going to abandon that because there comes a time in every battle when Satan quits. There comes a time in every war where Satan quits. Now, he may try to attack you in a different way, but in that way, he will quit. And when they dug the third well, the devil's cry didn't bother them. In fact, it was called, there's plenty of room for us to prosper. But they would never have got to that well unless they'd gone through the experience of the first two wells, which, of course, is representative of us starting or living or working for God or doing what we're doing and having terrible opposition and hatred. Are you being sued in the courts? Are you being tormented by your neighbor? Is your very spouse mad with you? What's going on? Don't quit. What will it do? Keep on digging wells. That is, keep on praising God. Keep on standing on the Word. Keep on coming to the house of God. Until what? Until God breaks through. The victory is yours. And there's plenty of room, not only for refreshing water, but for all the prosperity it will bring. Amen. Do you get the point, friends? If you do, praise Him with me. <laughs> praise God. It says there at the bottom of what we just read, ye shall be fruitful in the land. Genesis 26. And the Lord appeared unto him that same night. Verse 24. And said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee, and I will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there, and he called upon the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there his Isaac's, and their Isaac's servants digged another well. That's four. And it came to pass that same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged. And they said unto him, We have found water. That was a big deal, refreshment. And he called it Sheba, which is part of the word Beersheba. Or a treaty was made. Therefore the name of that city is Beersheba unto this day. Go back a verse there to Genesis 26, 24. But I don't want you to look at it. I want you to look to me. And I'm going to read this with just slight application changes for you, and you, and you, and you. And the Lord is going to appear unto you the same night. Has it been nighttime in your life? God's coming to you. It's no accident you're here. My life is not conducted by accidents. If you're here, you're supposed to be here. You're supposed to hear this. This is not a little charming two before message that lasts for 20 minutes. This is to give you truth, to get in touch with God, to get your life changed. Have you been in a night time? Have they been filling up your wells? It's not very funny, is it? The Lord is coming to you in your nighttime experience through this message. And you know what He's saying to you? I am the God of Abraham your father. And the God of faith, that is. And then he's saying these words. Can you hear it over here? Fear not, I am with you. Every one of you, you hear. Fear not, God says, I am with you. I know you're in the night time, but I am with you. Night time, not just literally, but figuratively in an experience in your life. Fear not, he's with you. Fear not, he's with you. I absolutely declare it in God's name as his servant, whose I am and whom I serve, I declare it as a domato. God is with me and God is with you and you're going to climb that wall with that kernel of corn and you're going to get to the top. God is going to deliver you. Well, if only you had my problems, Leslie. They used to tell of a legend, a fanciful story in history, where people were complaining about the crosses they had to bear. And one day the king said, well, everybody's complaining, so we arrange such and such a day, and everybody can come to the market square, and you can trade crosses. 
with each other. And so they had a whole day of trading crosses. And when they checked out through the city gate, the keepers noticed that everybody was going away with the same cross that he came in with. They all noticed that uh, and believed maybe somebody else had worse one even than they. But you may be tempted to say, you don't know what I'm facing. Maybe not, and I don't trivialize it. Still, I am telling you, no matter what it is, caused by yourself and your stupidity or my stupidity or by a family member, a daughter, a son, whoever, listen, I'm God. You're in the nighttime, but I am with you. Fear not. Why? Because through this message that this Irish preacher has given to you, I am with you and I have come this morning and I have come to bless you and I have come to multiply your seed because of my servant Jesus. And it says he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and they dug another well. And this time it was a treaty unto God and unto others. They were established in blessing. Why? Because they wouldn't quit when the first well was filled up or the second one either. I've got to say this. I'm not saying this is the spirit of prophecy, but it almost feels like it. In Jesus' name, He is saying to you there, in the depths of your nighttime, I am with you. I am with you. You mustn't stop digging that well, no matter how many demons have filled it up or seemingly filled it up. For I will bless you. I will prosper you. You may say, I haven't got two dimes to my name. I am telling you in the night time of financial hardship, God is coming to you saying, I am blessing you and I am prospering you. All he asks for is your attitude, which will dig another well. Dig another well. Dig another well in Jesus' name. Go ahead and praise him. Dig another well. You get the point, don't you, friends? I, I, I got to say it again. I, I, I don't mean I need to shake somebody because you're smart people. But I want to say it. You are a candidate for this blessing. You are a candidate for God's prosperity and blessing and healing and health. And so are you. Every one of you are a candidate. It's like there's a big target on you and God shooting his blessings at you. That's what Macaria says. You're blessed. God wants to do it. Well, 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 what do I do? Dig another well. Refuse to quit. Don't give in. And don't just saunter along with uh, K or I, or I, whatever will be, what may be. Get involved in faith and start claiming these promises and say, God's setting me free and I'm going to prosper. Therefore, I have to read it again. God comes to you in the nighttime. He said, I am with you. Fear not. I'm blessing you. I'm multiplying you. And all I want you to do is keep on digging. Even when they try to run you out of time. Are you getting the point? In Jesus' name. Not somebody else. Not theoretically. Not a lesson in historicity. But for the here and now. Grab it. It's yours. And don't leave here the same person. Notice the names of the four wells. Ezek or Essek, contention. Sitna, hatred. Rehoboth, plenty of room. Sheba, from Beersheba, the treaty. Footnote, Genesis 26 is the only chapter devoted to Isaac alone. Most of his life he was overshadowed by Abraham his father, Jacob his son. Lessons learned from Isaac. Here's what it tells us. Number one, are you ready? He built an altar. That means he started to worship God. Look this way. What does worship mean? It's from two old words, a worth ship. That's where it comes from. People would go down to the harbor's edge. They would see a ship laden up with valuable things that was taken off across the seas. They wouldn't say there's a valuable ship. They would say there's a worth ship. It was contracted down to worship, meaning sending somebody else something of value. Nowadays, we think that worship is when you stand up and sing a few choruses. Worship, true worship is when you give Jesus Christ all of your life. You get saved. You accept Him as your personal Savior. Here, He built an altar. That is, uh, that's the point where it says, lessons learned from Isaac. He built an altar signifying worship. 
Then it says he pitched a tent signifying, I'm going to stay here in Christ. I'm not moving from this lifestyle. And thirdly, it says he dug a well. That is, he got the refreshment he needed. He got the victory of God. I've got to say it again, for here are the three keys. You worship God, give him everything. You pitch a tent, you become permanent in the blessing of God. And number three, you keep on obeying God, you dig a well, Water will come, refreshment will come, and victory will be yours in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a shout, will you please? Are you with me in this, friends? It is no, you're not looking at me, it is no disgrace to fall flat on your face. The disgrace is in lying there. It is no disgrace to fall flat on your face. A lot of times, the disgrace is in lying there. I'm trying to help you, to tell you, where is God this morning? Is he in the universe? You can be sure he's in the universe. Is he in this earth? God's here. Is he in North America? God's here. Is he in Florida? God's in Florida. Is he in Tarpon Springs? He's in Tarpon Springs. Is he in this sanctuary? He's here. God Almighty. Is he in our hearts? He's in our hearts. And he didn't get inside your heart for you to be a weak, sniveling, defeated person. He didn't do that. Well, what am I to do? You are going to build an altar. You're going to worship God. Give your life to God. You are going to what? You're going to pitch a tent. You're going to have permanence in being part of God's kingdom. You're going to dig a well. That is, you're going to keep on obeying God. Look at God's amazing law of displacement. I just want a few more minutes and I'm through. But I need a little encouragement. I need to know that we're all getting this. By a big praise God. Forget what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we are made fearfully and wonderfully. Look at your eyes. Aren't they marvelous? Look at your ears. Look at your feet that walk. Look at your heart. Look at your lungs. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. But you're made in the image of God. You were made to fly with the eagles. Not to fool around and mess around with the turkeys. Rise up. That's what Jesus said to people. Rise and be healed. Rise and be healed. Look at this. We're almost through, but this is powerful. Have you ever heard of God's amazing law of displacement? Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says, neither are my ways... Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. This word this morning is not going to return void. It shall accomplish in you that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing worked unto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now I want you to get these two words that have been made bold in the print. Instead of, not side by side, but instead of, the thorn shall come up the fir tree. What is that? Instead of the bad, shall come up the good. Instead of poverty, there comes up prosperity. Instead of sickness, there comes up health. Instead of defeat, there comes up victory. Not side by side. It's God's wonderful law of displacement where one thing is displaced and replaced by another, and that is God's blessing replaces the devil's tortures. Did you get that? Instead of Shout that out at me real loud. Instead of, not alongside, instead of. 
the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And so shall it be to the Lord for a name. Just stay here. Don't turn over yet. For an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What shall be to the Lord for a name? What is it about God that's going to be an everlasting sign that shall last forever? His ability, look this way, to replace defeat with victory. God's ability to replace defeat with victory right where it's at. I'm not a doctor or a nurse, but they tell me that if you break your arm, somebody here who's a doctor or a nurse, you could confirm this. They tell me that when it heals, that the bone is actually stronger at that point than any other part of where the bone is. It gets so strong, is that right? It heals up so strong at that point. Don't be like the man who said he'd been down for so long it never crossed his mind about getting up. Don't be like that. It's hard to imagine prosperity if you live on, in poverty or close to it. It's hard to imagine victory if every report is bad in your body. But change your mind. Why? Because God's law of displacement says, I'm going to change X for Y, A for B. I am going to do what? Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And that shall be to me for a name and for an everlasting sign that shall never be cut off that people are going to see. He or she that was dying so much have been raised up so powerfully, not because of themselves or their own goodness, but because they plugged in to the mighty power of God who's constantly interested in the brokenhearted and the downtrodden. Amen. Look at the summary. It couldn't be done by Edgar A. Guest. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied, that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he had tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one has ever done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat, and the first thing we knew, he had begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, Without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done. And you'll do it. Amen. Now listen as I close. I give illustrations sometimes from my son because he flies these jets. And for you who are pilots, he flies them at like 49,000 feet. And he was telling me just uh, last evening, in fact, he called. And when they fly, of course, from New York or somewhere going to L.A., I say this to close, going to, to Nevada or California or somewhere, he said, you see so much flat land until you hit the Rockies. And he said, they seem even from the air impregnable. The Rockies are so powerful. And he said, you know, when you think about the forefathers and the old pilgrims, many of them with uh, chariots and horses and covered wagons and so forth coming across the plains and a lot of it wasn't too high. And then a lot stopped at the Rockies. I mean, how can you get horses across the Rockies or those covered-in wagons? But they would have missed Nevada. They would have missed Washington. They would have missed San Francisco. They would have missed the Pacific Ocean. But many, somehow or other, got over the Rockies, and they found that new territory. Look at me as I close with everything in my being, loving you and speaking to you. Is there a Rockies? Is there a mountain range? of Rockies standing up in front of you. It's no joke. We don't trivialize it. 
but there's wonderful territory ahead. And with God's help, you can just start right in with a bit of a grin. And with God's help, you can get over those Rockies, or if necessary, you can get through them, or if necessary, you can get around them, or somewhere or other, you can conquer all the Rockies in your life. And somewhere or other, you can win. Somewhere or other, you can dig another well and see God's prosperity. Did the kernel of corn of your prosperity that you were depending on, your health, your strength, your money, did it slip and fall? I say again, it's not funny. Lift it again. According to Tamerlane, the little ant did it and won. You got God inside you. You can do it again, and you can win in Jesus' name. So I say to you, don't quit, but rather go again and stand and tell the Lord you love him and praise him as we stand right now. Stand, everybody, and put your hands together. Let me hear you praising God, praising God, praising God. Praising God. Come on. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Come on. Come on. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise the Lord.